And, and so we had something like this, like here's a five by three grid. And you start in the upper left corner of the grid. And we agreed to kind of use this convention that like, you know, if you don't like, you're welcome to use another convention in your program as long as, you know, you're consistent, things will work, will work out. Uh, the convention is that, you know, we decided to use image coordinates, so y is kind of going down this way, so the y coordinates are actually 0, 1, 2 here, like, like so. This, I mean, some people think it should be the other way, and that's fine too, but this is kind of like image coordinates, right? Like these are like pixel coordinates on like a standard like image representation. And then we, you know, x goes forward as normal in this direction. And everything is zero index. This is just the convention we're using. Like, you're welcome to use your own convention. You can start the indices at one. I don't particularly recommend it, but you could. Uh, however, you know, you want to do it. As long as you're consistent, you don't, you know, you don't go outside the bounds of the array or whatever. Uh, okay, so, so, so here we had a, a grid. And basically, you start here in the grid. You start at the upper left corner. And your goal is to get here. This is a very, very classic problem. There's like a million different variations on this problem you see too. Um, and, but in this particular variation, what we saw is that you have a number uh, in each, you know, everywhere in the grid. There can be negative numbers too. It doesn't really change the gist of the problem, at least not at the current state of the, n n not in this current variation. It doesn't really change anything if some of the numbers can be negative. Uh, so maybe in some later variations it will actually become important that some of the numbers can be negative. So you know your grid is populated like so, and your goal. Well, I guess there's a number here too. Your goal is like like this is basically the amount of coins you collect by being at each cell of this grid, and you're like a bulldozer. And you start here, and your goal is to end up here. And the constraint for this first variation of the problem you saw is you can move, you can move down or right. So you cannot move left and you cannot move up. So essentially you can't just go like, like, like so and try to pick up as many things as you can. You have to kind of take an efficient route to the exit, where you're only allowed to go right and you're only allowed to go down. Like, so basically every move you have a choice. You can go down or you can go right. So for example, if I choose to go right here, I can, I can go like this. I can get, get like three, five, five. And then here, if I decide to go this way, I would get negative 10, but I can decide to go here and get five. Uh, so your goal is to basically find the maximum profit path. Uh, so here, the maximum profit path is, uh, I, it's probably this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna like, explicitly computed, but I, I think probably it would be this. This is probably the best path. It's hard for me to see how another path would be better here. Uh, but see, the, like this path is completely only moving down and to the right. And that was the constraint of the problem. So like, for example, we could increase our score if we went like this, but this is not allowed. If you want to get these numbers, you would have to like go through here, and then you would pick up some negative numbers, and maybe you don't want that. Uh, th this is probably the best path, but if it's not, you know, please forgive me because I didn't actually compute it, I just kind of eyeballed it. Uh, but you get the point. The point is to find the optimal path, and this was the, uh, I call this the coin collector, coin bulldozer problem. It's not like the official name of the problem, it's just the name I kind of made up for it. Uh, so, if you recall, um, we said that basically when you want to solve a problem using Dynamic programming, before you even think, like, do you solve it using dynamic programming, you got to think, uh, you know, can I express the solution recursively? Because dynamic programming techniques, even if in the end you end up with some kind of solution that in the code has no recursion, they're all based on the concept of recursion. Uh, so you have to see, like, can we solve this problem recursively? And we found that, yes, that basically, here's how we can think about it. Let f of x and y we might also, in the code, you know, include another argument here that is just like the grid. And you know, this is just being passed by like, if, if we pass the grid here, it would just be basically being passed by, you know, by like a reference. It's, you know, not, we are not modifying the grid anywhere in the algorithm. So this is essentially a constant and we don't cache this parameter because, because it's a constant for the duration of the recursion. It's not like a constant in the program, but it's a constant from when you start the algorithm, you know, this is your input and you never change it. 
But so the true parameters of the recursion are x and y. And we said that define x and y, that like f is going to be a function, define f of x and y as the optimal payoff starting from position x, y and going until the end. So f of 0, 0, we observe that f of 0, 0 is the solution. f of 0, 0 is like the overall solution to the problem. Because it's the optimal payoff starting from 0, 0 and going until the end. Now, we need to, to actually evaluate this. Like, we only want one set of parameters. We want 0, 0. But in order to evaluate it, we're actually going to have to express it generally. We're going to have to give an expression here. So the expression we gave was basically this. And I'm kind of omitting base cases here. Base cases are, so always start with the general case, because the general case will basically inform you, like, you know, can you even express it recursively? Uh, are you able to find a way to express it recursively? That is, uh, what is, you know, how many parameters does your recursion require? It'll really kind of like tell you a lot about your solution. Base cases are usually kind of details that, you know, can be worked out after the fact. So what is a base case here? Base case would be like, okay, I'm at the end. I get some payoff for being at the end, I just get these five coins. Or another base case might be like if you're on the edge. If you're on the edge, you can't go down, so that won't, might not fall under a general case. Uh, so, you know, we'll have to handle those for sure, but like, you know, don't, never focus on that initially. So, depending on how your matrix is structured in the code, it may be like g of y, x instead, as it was in my code sample. But the point is that we want to access whatever part of the grid corresponds to coordinate x and y. Uh, that's the intent here. So basically, if we are at position x, y, the optimal payoff is first you collect whatever is at that position. In this problem, you have no choice. Like, even if you are at a negative number, you must collect. Uh, it's like a, it's, so either basically as you pass through a cell, either you collect some number of coins or you pay a toll. And you have to pay the toll. Uh, so g of x, y, you always collect g of x, y. And then you make one of two choices, right? And so because you have like these two choices, which choice will you make? You will make the one that has the best payoff. Because you're looking for the overall best payoff here, and this term is fixed. So if you want the best payoff, you must select the best possible continuation of the route that you can. So uh, let's calculate the, the payoff of both routes and take the max of the two, is what we said. So uh, route one is you would go here from three to five. And then notice that because you can only go right and to the and then down, because you, you can only go right and down, that means that at this cell, uh, basically everything that happened before is irrelevant. Like if you are at some position, like let's say you are here, only the things down here matter, and all of your previous collections were up here somewhere, were like in this part. So uh, basically, when, after you move, it's as if your new subcase is kind of a clean subset of the other one. So you started, you know, you started at three, you collected three, but now you can just say that essentially the remaining problem is just f of, if you went right, the remaining problem is this, if, right? Because basically nothing that happened before matters. Uh, if any, anything you collected, like, if, if this is your x, y, anything you collected before must be like in this area but anything you will collect in the future is in this area. So, it, it, so it's basically as if you have a completely clean subproblem here. So uh, f of x, y is max of f of x plus one y. And of course you can choose to go down as well, which would give you x and y plus one here. So, uh, you know, th this is the optimal payoff if you choose to go right. This is the optimal payoff if you choose to go down. You pick the better of the two, and then you add your current value of the set. And this is the, the general case. So now we've expressed this generally. Uh, what about the base cases? Well, we said, like, if you're at this cell, if you're at this ending cell, just a specific you know, x and y position, then you know, just return this value right away. Uh, and if you're at the edge, well, there's two ways you can handle, like, say, being here, right? You could say that if you're, if, if, for example, you can't go down, then your payoff is just g of x, y plus the, you know, just remove from the max basically anything that you're not allowed to take. 
Uh, and conceptually, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to remove from the max any option that is out of bounds and you're not allowed to take. We saw kind of like one like hacky shortcut, but these kind of hacky shortcuts, I want you to see it because they're common in dynamic programming. Uh, you know, we saw like one hacky shortcut that instead of like making this code for the max kind of complicated because each term will have to be tested, like, you know, is, you'll, here you'll have to say, is x plus one in bounds? If yes, then include this term, otherwise skip it. That gets kind of hairy. So instead, if, if you know you have a max of a bunch of items, what you can do is anything that's out of bounds, just make it negative infinity. It'll never be selected. But it'll never be selected if it's uh, negative infinity. Hello? Hi. Uh, can you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I don't know if that person was there for a session. Okay. Uh, maybe. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, you you have uh, you you have these uh, terms, and yeah, if you're on the edge, you would want to exclude any term you're not allowed to take. But if you just substitute negative infinity for that value, that may lead to like slightly uh, cleaner code. Uh, it may it it may lead to code where. Um, you know, you can just kind of write it like this, and here, all the terms that are not allowed to be taken will return negative infinity. Okay. So, uh, this was simple enough, and hopefully, like, you all have enough background in dynamic programming that you sort of understand the solution. Uh, you know, like I said, there's some base cases here, but that's not really what we're going to focus on. Uh, okay. So now, I want to do a more complicated variation of this problem. So the new variation of this problem is this. So same problem, you want to maximize the payout. Uh, you know, first, any questions on this? Hopefully there's not too many, but uh, I will you know, stop for a minute to take any questions on, on this so far. OK, great. I think maybe people did their homework. Uh, OK, so uh, new variation of this problem. This one's harder. Uh, this one's more exciting too, because you know it really like you know will challenge us a little bit. The other one is kind of easy. Uh, well, so the new version is you are now allowed to go up as well. So you're still not allowed to go right. That makes it too hard. We're not we're not ready for that. And in fact, I don't even know that there is an efficient algorithm for that version of it. So we probably will never be ready for that. But uh, like, let's take the version where you, you you're still constrained. Like you cannot go left. But you are allowed to go right, and you're also allowed to go either up or down. But here's the catch. So uh, to prevent you from just racking up infinite points, we kind of have to modify the problem, right? Because, because if you're allowed to go up and down, like why not just go like 3, 6, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. And you know, whenever you're ready, you can go out here. But there's no like optimal path, because the more time, number of times you repeat the 5, the higher score you get. Like, you know, if you say some number, I can just say a higher number of repetitions, and, you know, it's, the maximum score is infinite, basically. Right? Uh, so here's the rule. You are just, we're just going to forbid double bagging. Like, you can never, you are not allowed to visit a cell that you visited before. In this first version. After this, we're going to do another follow-up. That's even more exciting and even harder. Which, where you are allowed to double back, but if you double back, you just don't collect the coin the second time around. So like you can double back all you want, but if you do, you just like you only get the coin the first time you visit it. Uh, and after that, it's just a blank set. Whether, like whether the value is negative or positive, it's just worth zero. So that would also prevent the infinite loop. There's no point in going back and forth infinitely if you can only collect each item once. Uh, so, um, but first, let's do this version. Like we're just simply going to prohibit you from doubling back. Now, why, um, why are the two, well, okay, never mind. I'll cover later when we get to the second variation why it even matters, why the two versions are different. Like why you can actually get a higher score if you are allowed to double back. Uh, but for now, let's just take this. Um, by the way, for people who are new and don't know like the logistics of this session, it is like a long like three hour kind of session, but don't worry. Like there will be like a break halfway in between. Uh, you know, so you will get a chance to like, you know, take a break uh, at some point. So uh, th this, is the, th this is the first version we're focusing on. 
So you, start, you still start here, and you have to end up here. You're allowed to go to the right, down, and up. This is like a pretty non-standard version of this problem. I, I, mean, I actually did get this problem in an interview at one point. It's kind of a challenging problem. It's not like this version of it is not too bad, though. Uh, but let's, like, we're, we are going to kind of gradually build up to the solution so we can kind of see the principles. The solution it itself is not like that hard to understand outright, but I do want to show kind of like some not so successful ideas along the way so you can see kind of the essence of exactly what we want to do when solving dynamic programming problems. It's very educational here to see which approaches don't work as well as which approaches work. Uh, so, uh, so here, you might be able to, in some cases, score way higher than you could in the previous version, right? Because all of the previous paths are still valid, but now, for example, we can modify our path here to also pick up some values, you know, all around here, right? So any path that was valid before is still valid, so all the new scores are only going to be strictly higher. But you, might, you have an opportunity to score additional points like so. As long as you don't double back. Okay. So uh, let's you know try the first thing that comes to mind, right? What is like the first idea? We should write a recursive formula, right? Uh, so what we're going to do in this class, like keep in mind that like the transformation to add the cache is just always kind of like you know a very well understood transformation. There's a standard way that we covered last time to add to add the cache. So we'll just focus on getting the recursion. And, you know, as I told you last time, it seems weird that dynamic programming is treated as this advanced topic when all it is is ju it's just recursion and then you add this optimization on top of it. And maybe you add another optimization to make it bottom up. So uh, it does seem kind of weird, but the thing is that recursion with dynamic programming, recursion becomes so powerful now that we will have to stretch our understanding of recursion. We'll have to get better at recursion. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to write a recursive formula. And yeah, well, let's try. And first, I'm going to get it wrong. But it's educational to see like what, why it's wrong. So the most logical extension of what we did before is this. So when when you see it, uh, you know, see if you can see why it's wrong. So this first one, I think it's not you know hard to see what's wrong with this. Uh, I mean, don't worry about base cases. Just like even as a general formula, what's you know, what's wrong with this idea? Like, why not just add a third term? Like, what's, what's bad about this? Constraints are not satisfying. Yeah, like, okay, so for one, right, there's nothing that's even satisfying the constraint that you can't double back. Like, this actually allows double back. Second of all, this formula is circular. Uh, because, uh, remember, like, what will happen in the evaluation of this formula? Let's look at the recursion tree. X, Y gets expanded to x plus 1, y. Um, you know, it gets expanded to some other things, but I'm not even going to focus on that right now. You get like x, y plus 1, and well, OK. I guess I'll draw it out, x, y minus 1. OK. But what does, um, let, let's just like focus on these two. Uh, one of the cases that this will expand to just by this rule, where you take the y and you do minus 1, is x, y, right? This will go back to y. And this is circular. Now, you might think, ah, but I'm using dynamic programming. It's fine if my things are circular, right? No, 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 no. Uh, so remember, dynamic programming doesn't save you from having to follow the rules of recursion of like ha having your things be non-circular. Because, I mean, forget about the fact that we're not even satisfying the constraint here. Like, let's say this was even correct. This would be like, like correct, like math, you know, it's like some like mathematical equivalency sense. Uh, this would still be bad because you have the circularity, so you can never evaluate it. Because remember what dynamic programming does, right? It opens this recursive call. Let's say this this value is not in the cache. We have not yet cached the tuple x y as the key, right? We will attempt to do this recursion, and once we finish it, we will add the value of x y to the cache. But here we are opening another call to x y, which will not be satisfied by the cache because this value has not yet been added to the cache. This has to complete before you can, like this call would have to complete before the value for x, y will be in the cache. So it's totally fine if this is called by some other method, and then this method calls x, y. This is fine as long as like this is something reasonable, because this will complete 
place the value in the cache, and then when this is evaluated again, you will just have the answer. It, but it has to be a different part of the subtree. It's not allowed, it's not allowed that xy requires the value of xy. Now, probably to most people this is like pretty obvious, but I want to you know, mention that just in case. Like, don't think that because you're using dynamic programming, because you're using this really powerful optimization, the rules of recursion don't apply to you. They still do. You still have to have something non-circular for dynamic programming. And actually, circularity will be kind of a major theme of uh, today's uh, problems, because as you'll see, it's not always like that easy to actually avoid a circular definition in these more complicated problems. You really have to take care to make sure that your definition is actually non-circular and is actually moving you towards the base cases that will eventually constitute a solution. So technically, this is all just recursion. It's just it's more maybe more complicated recursion than you've done. Uh, okay, so here this is like complete garbage. This is not satisfying the constraints, right? But kind of philosophically, there is almost like a deeper problem to this. So. The problem is that we shouldn't even be writing f of x, y. Because this concept doesn't even make as much sense as you think it might. Because remember in the other problem, like why the, the first version, right? Where you could only go right and left. Or sorry, you could only go right and down. Why did we say, you know, let f of x, y be the optimal solution starting at x, y and going to the end? It's because for that problem, that was like a well-defined, meaningful concept, where if you are at position x, y, you can kind of unambiguously say, what is the best path from the current position to the end? So it turns out for this problem, this concept doesn't make as much sense as you think. Because, see, for the other problem, uh, let's say you started with, um, uh, for example, let, let's say you started with x equals 0, y equals 0. And you said, give me the best solution for x equals 0, y equals 0. And then, you, you know, you would recurse and, and you, you would get, you know, a subcase for x equals 1, y equals 0. And you would get a subcase for x equals 0, y equals 1. And then here, at some point, you would generate this subcase. And here you would also generate the subcase. And so the reason dynamic programming was helping you is because you were saying these two have the same solution. Like when you give me an x and a y, I can tell you what the solution is. And no matter how, th this, this is what I would call history. This is the history of your past choices. So uh, basically the solution from 1-1 one, one is you are in this cell. You are in this shaded cell. That is the solution from 1-1. One, one. And in the last problem, it was the case that the best solution to go from this cell, if this is where you are currently, to go to the end is independent of how you got to the cell. And that's why we can have this kind of information here where we share the information between two different histories. So there are two different timelines here, right? So now that I've illustrated the problem, I don't think having the specific values up here is super useful right now. Instead, I'll draw it like this, just kind of more focusing on what's important. OK, so let's say this is the cell 1-1, one, one, right? This shaded cell. There are two ways you could have gotten there. You could have gotten there this way, and you could have gotten there this other way, right? And what we are saying when we say that f of 1-1 one, one has some meaning. From the bottom two. From the bottom two. Sorry. You can get it from the bottom. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about the last problem we did. In the last problem we did, we were, we were only allowed to go right and down. In the last problem, f of 1, 1 was a meaningful concept. This was a meaningful concept because regardless of how we got to this f of 1, 1, regardless of whether we went this way or we went this way, f of 1, 1 is, represents a subproblem that starts here and ends here. So it basically represents the solution to as if your array was just this larger rectangle. And the solution to this is completely independent of your past history. Uh, and the reason it's independent is because when you only can go right and down, it means that 
any past history is constrained to basically like this quadrant, right? Because you were only coming, going right and down. So any past history is constrained to here, but any future is, is here. So these are disjoint. You don't, you don't ever have the risk of picking up the same cell twice. You don't have to know what your past is to know what actions you're allowed to take in the future. And that's why in that problem, defining f of x, y was so powerful, because we could say that regardless of how you arrived at this state, this state will always have the same value. And so if you arrive at the same state, this is why I call this concept state. Uh, some people call it state, some people call it you know, function parameters. But I think it's more kind of informative to call it state. Because imagine you're a robot, right? And you know, you're going along this maze, and every step of the way you have to make a choice. Your current state is basically just the, you know, your current like, you know, the, the information you need to know about where you are and what you've done so far in order to figure out how to get optimally to the end. And in th the initial version of the problem, you had f of 1, 1. Uh, and, and you could define this f of x, y, which captures all the state you need to know about. Uh, you need, you, all you needed to know is your current x, y. Your past history doesn't matter. Only your current x, y matters. And if you know your current x, y, you can find the optimal path to the end. Let's see how that fails in this new version of the problem. And that will suggest to us that we cannot have a function that's defined in terms of f of x, y. We need something else. Uh, why does this not work for the version of the problem that goes up? Well, let's say I claimed that I have some answer for like what is the best path starting at x, y and going to the end. And let's say I claimed that this best path, just hypothetically speaking, was this one. OK. OK, so I go down here, go, go across, and go to the end. But I'm not allowed to take this path under every circumstance, right? Like, I cannot say that this is the best solution for if, you, if I'm currently at position 1, at x equals 1, y equals 1. Why not? Because I may be forbidden from going to the square. Because, because what if I arrived at the square, like if I arrived at it this way or this way, I'm fine. But what if I arrived at the square via this path? Then actually, I would be forbidden from taking this path. and. I would be forced to take some other path, and maybe my other best solution is like super different. Right? Oh, well, sorry. You know, may maybe my best solution is now super different based on the fact that I had a different history leading up to 1-1. One, one. I'm actually not allowed to take whatever path you said is best, and if you try to claim this path is best, I will say, well, I'm not allowed to take that path if you got there from here. If you got here from the top, then you're not allowed to take this one. Maybe you're going to be forced to take that one. So the problem is that x and y doesn't capture all the relevant information about your state. Because, because it doesn't just matter what your current x, y position is, like it did in the previous version of the problem, right? In the previous version of the problem, we didn't need to know our history. Because we knew our history was confined to a region that could never affect the future solution. But this is no longer true. Now, we cannot give the best path from just a coordinate because we need to know where you came from in order to tell you what your best remaining options are. So that what this effectively means is that we fail to capture all of the information needed to resolve the problem here. Now, um, you might say, well, why don't we defeat this problem, this issue, by you know, just throwing definitions at it? Why don't we just give a hard definition that f of x, y is not just defined as the best solution if we are currently at x and y? Like, we can, we're allowed to tack additional things onto the definition. Let's say f of x and y is the best solution if you start at position x, y, and additionally, you have never visited anything below and to the right of you. Like, why not just define it that way? Then that kind of eliminates this problem, right? Well, no, because then, because then when you go to write the recurrence, you'll find that you have no way of actually writing that recurrence. Like, because, because then, uh, when you go to define f of x, y, whatever expressions you write here of other f, they have to satisfy that new constraint that you gave in the definition. If you're saying f of x, y is defined as, you know, 
uh, why would I define it this way? Well, it's because uh, just to be kind of similar to how we did it in the first problem that we solved successfully, the idea would be in the other problem when I evaluated f11, it was as if I was evaluating just this subrectangle, right? So maybe I want the same effect in this problem. Maybe I want to say that I'm just going to treat f of 1, 1 as if I am uh, you know, evaluating this subrectangle. So it's kind of essentially saying I'm in position 1, 1, and furthermore, I have never been to the cells below me or to the right of me. Uh, but if you write it that way, you'll find that you have no way of actually like, making the recursion work because any other call to f you make in the, you know, the expression that you write for f, whatever, you, you know, this will have some calls to f, you will find that you're unable to respect the same constraint over here. Because you know, you'll, at, at some point you'll have to write some expression that involves you know, x plus 1, y, that will probably be fine. You'll have to write some expression that involves x, y plus 1, that will probably be fine. And you'll have to write some expression that involves this, and that won't be fine. Because if all you know is that you're here, and you've never been to the cells below or to the right of you, you will never be able to say anything about the contents of this cell. So you're going to be like, you know, you're not going to have any ability to write that recursion. So it kind of really seems like we need to capture more state. We need more information about, like we can't just say like what is the best solution given x and y, but we can maybe say given x and y and some more information, what is the best solution? And this is what we have to do. And this is kind of a pretty general approach for these like, more complex dynamic programming problems. The key is always, how do you capture your state? How do you capture your, a complete snapshot of everything you need to know about your past actions to determine your future actions towards the, towards the goal? In order to determine the future like from the current position you're in, like think you're like a robot and you're making the decisions on the fly. From the current position you're in, what information about your past and your current state do you need in order to figure out how to get to the optimal solution from the position you're already at, you know, just going forward from your current position. So uh, clearly just knowing our position is not enough. We need some information about our past. Uh, so uh, attempt number one, and this will kind of like not be very good, but I want you to see why it's not very good because it's like really instructive to see you know, why it's not very good. How about this? I will also capture in my state a complete set, a complete representation of all the cells I have visited in the past. This is like the most straightforward idea, right? Because this is like very directly maps to the constraint we want to satisfy. We want to satisfy the constraint that no cells is uh, you know, visited twice. Let's just map uh, let, let's just, you know, include a set D. And this set D is the set of all visited cells. Uh, so, um, basically for 1, 1, if, if I came like this, V would equal, uh, V would be like the set of two tuples that would, that would contain X equals 0, Y equals 0, X 0, Y 1, X 0, Y 2, uh, it would contain this one too, which is 1, 2, oh sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, 1, 2, uh, and well, we don't include the current cell. So like here, this would be V. So V is like this complex set. Now already like last time, we kind of said like it's kind of bad to include sets as the thing you memorize in dynamic programming. Uh, do folks kind of like remember like why that is? What, what's so bad about you know capturing a set in the recursion? Overhead in terms of storing and context with the stack is unwinding. No, that really has nothing to do with it. The, the, number the number of states. The number of states. Because remember, we said the time complexity of our dynamic programming solution, right? Like, that's why we don't just go for naive recursion. We want to improve the time complexity. Uh, but the time complexity of our dynamic programming solution is the number of states multiplied by the amount of work per state. So assume you even manage to do order one work per state. How many distinct states do you expect to have if the cache key consists of x, y, and the set v? 
How many do you think that is? It's, it's quite a lot, actually. Right? Because how many, okay, it's how many, we know how many distinct values of x and y. If the dimensions are m by n, it's m by n. And previously, in the, in, you know, the first version of the problem, where the only keys we had, or the, the key just consisted of x and y, we were able to see that we have order m times n states. Each state is solved in order one, and the total time complexity is order mn, which is the same as the time complexity of just reading the input. So we knew that solution was asymptotically optimal. But how about now? Uh, how many distinct values can this v have? Like, just you know, just to indulge ourselves, let's uh, let's estimate it. Uh, what is like just an upper bound, quick upper bound on like how many? Okay, so so this is m. Let's call the number of rows m. Number of columns is n. How many? How many uh, different values for v are possible? In squared. In squared. No. Mn. Mn. Into the power of n. That's better. Uh, yeah, yeah. Definitely powers, right? It's not. It's not like n times n, because like remember, uh, something counts as a distinct value if it's distinct in any way that matters functionally for that object. A set is distinct from another set if even one element differs. Like order doesn't matter for a set because it's a set, but. Uh, if a set differs from another set by even one element, it's a different set. I, I sometimes feel like people are just guessing at these complexities. <laughs> like, I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to be mean, but like, why would even fact, like, I don't even know like why factorial would. Like, but there's no like, oh, okay, okay, well, at the very least, it's like combinations, right? Okay, oh, oh, okay, so, so m, m to the nth power was not really what I was looking for, but that's the closest guess I heard. Uh, like the bound I'm looking for is, you know, the, there can be 2 to the m n power. Why is that? Because every element of this set can be present or absent. So this is not true. This is overestimating the complexity. Like in some cases, like it will not be possible. Uh, for some, like some histories are impossible, right? Yeah, I could show you uh, uh, an example of a history that is impossible. Like for example, I could claim you visited this cell and you visited this cell and you visited nothing else. That's actually impossible, right? Or I could claim that you visited some cells that are to the, I, I could claim that you know, you're here but you've already visited a cell over here. Also impossible. Um, so I could give you like impossible histories, so you can rule out some numbers based on that. But just as a quick upper bound, the most reasonable way to count it is like you have to ask how many distinct values of this object can you have? Uh, and this is a set, so a set every every element can be present or absent. The the real kind of I was looking for like a really like easy upper bound here that you should be able to calculate like on the spot like immediately, uh, which is like this expression because. Because basically, for like every value, um, for basically every value in the set, you can just think like worst case scenario. Like, okay, let's not rule out the impossible histories. Let's just you know just say every value in the set can be present or absent. So there can be m n different values, right? Uh, and so and, and so each one can be present or absent. So it's combinations. Uh, the number of distinct sets of like k elements is 2 to the kth power, right? Uh, and so this is 2 to the mn. Okay, but now you have to also take x and y into account because they combine in combination. There are n values of this one and n values of this one. So, okay, so this is our bound. This is how many states. And the code for this, uh, at least, you know, we can console ourselves with the fact that the, co the code for this is easy to write. So, so then you uh, have this expression. It's pretty... It's pretty high, right? This is a pretty bad complexity. This actually still might be lower than if you solve it with naive recursion. It, it might be. Uh, with, because with naive recursion, um, you could, uh, a path can be of size up to mn. And so the only like clear bound I can give on a naive recursion is like 3 to the power of mn. And maybe this is like still better. The, like, this is like the only like immediate clear bound I can give on the recursion. Uh, so, so, so maybe like we are saving something here, but in practice, like if you're going to do this, you might as well just like forget the caching. It's it's pretty bad. 
the, the code for this, on the other hand, is straightforward to write, right? You just keep around, you, you just keep the parameter v, you cache tuples of x, y, v. Uh, you know, you can, you can, uh, like you'll, in some languages that will insist that you turn v into like some kind of immutable object. Like I think Python will have you like convert it to like, I don't know, like a sorted tuple or something like that or some immutable set. And then it'll allow you to hash it and take that, take it and put it in the map. Uh, there may be some additional like small factors here, like even like copying the sets or modifying the sets may take like, you might actually not spend order one time in each state, you might spend like mn time in each state because you have to copy these large sets. So in the end you may get also like order mn time per state and you may get like a final complexity of I don't know, like m squared n squared times 2 mn depending on, 2 to the mnth power depending on how you do it. So. Um, Uh, th this is like not, not a great solution. But why is the solution bad? Well, it'd be, it's because it caches an object that can have a lot of possible values, right? But are all of those values important? So for example, if I am here, does my history at all over here matter? Does it matter which cells I visited on, on a row to my left? No, why not? Yeah, it can't go back, right? So I can never go back to those cells, so it doesn't matter if I visited them or not. Okay, one idea for improvement is how about V will now only contain cells that are in the current column. This is better, right? Because now there's less possible values because these cells don't, no longer consist of two tuples. Now V is just a set of indices. So V will just be some set of indices. Like, I don't know, I visited one, two, three, four. Um, so now this, uh, there's fewer possibilities. Or sorry, I, it's uh, two to the m, the way I define the notation, yes. Here we go. Uh, so, so, so now the number of possible states is, has been reduced. This is way better. Uh, still not very good, right? We want to kind of avoid these kind of exponential things, ideally. So, you know, once in a while, you'll find dynamic programming problems where, like, there's just no way to kind of optimize this sort of thing away. Um, I, I remember solving, like, some problem where, like, I, I think it was, it was, like, a problem where one of the dimensions was very long, but the other one was very short. So, it, it was something like, you know, you're given a 5 by 500 chessboard, and then there's, like, queens attacking each other on this chessboard. And in that problem, the intended solution was actually to have a set V like this, um, and, be, and you would only use it on this dimension, which is of size 5. So the number of possible subsets of size 5 is just like 32. And that's pretty small, and that's fine. Because basically only one of the dimensions was large, and it wasn't this one. Um, so, you know, you, you may, like, uh, the reason I'm showing you these techniques is because these techniques are actually important. Like, this isn't just like some completely bogus solution. I mean, for this problem it is, but uh, there are problems where it, you actually do need to maintain exponentially many states, and that's like the only solution you can think of, and it may still beat the naive recursive solution. So it's important to have this kind of technique in your arsenal. Keep in mind that you can cache a set or an array or something like this here. It probably will lead to a bad complexity, but sometimes bad complexity is the only thing you have. But in this case, we can find ways to improve it more. Okay, so how can we improve it further? Well, let's kind of further try to prune the history, right? So do we actually need to know about all the cells we visited in the current row? So okay, we decided we don't need to know about this row, right? You know, forget. Like this row we said, okay, we're gonna forget everything, everything we did in this row. Okay. How, how about here? Do we, need, we do need, obviously, some history about this row. We saw that like, why we can't just like, ignore it. Uh, okay, uh, what, what, what do you think we need? The well, for, huh? The direction you came from. Yeah, the direction you came from sounds promising. Um, I, that, that is actually what we will get to in the end. But for first, I want to uh, suggest kind of another possibility, which is that you know, maybe you realize that this set will always have contiguous values. Uh, like, this set is always going to have numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, 6, 7, 8, right? It, it can never have skips 
And the reason is uh, because, like, okay, so at some point we transitioned from this row to this row, right? We transitioned in here. But then after that, we're constrained in moving, like, if we want to stay this, within the same row, we go either up or down, and we go so contiguously. And when we stop moving contiguously, we cross over to the next row to never come back. So now you can realize that the history will always have a particular shape. It is not just any arbitrary set that can happen. And actually, like, even if you cached a set here, like, already you would be getting the better time complexity resulting from the fact that only certain subsets are possible. But you just aren't including that in the analysis yet. And you may have some inefficiencies because you may be copying sets around when you don't need to. So we can replace the set with just two numbers. Let's replace this with a start and end. Does that make sense? So like essentially in this row, we won't really maintain like a detailed history using a set of every like cell we've been to. Instead, if, like, if we are here, like this is our xy, we will just remember that the cells we visited in this row, we will remember a starting cell and an ending cell of the things we visited in this row, which are just two integers. So we'll remember, you know, for any given row, regardless of where we are, like we are like in this column and we are over here, we will just remember, you know, the range. We will say, we, we will remember that we visited everything from here to here because we know it's contiguous. So already, we should be able to write a recurrence for something like this. And this will now take us out of the exponential zone. Because how many combinations of these are? These are now integers. Good news, right? M possibilities for this one, M possibilities for this one. And this gets us to M uh, cubed M. So this is still not ideal, but this is getting us to a much better uh, state. So it turns out that we can solve this problem more efficiently. We're going to be able to solve this problem just like the last one in MN. So then finally we realize, okay, not only, not, we can discard even more history, joy, because, because look, like let's say we are here, this is our Y, this must also be either our starting or our ending point, right? Because we have to travel here contiguously. Like, if this is our y, and this was our n, that means we traveled like this. It cannot be, for example, that, that we are here, and it cannot be that we are here, and this is our start, and this is our end, right? Because how did that happen? You had to cross over somewhere, and then after that, you, when you start moving in one direction, you can never double back. So if you, if you cross over here, or you cross over here, like, you could only go in one direction. You cannot be here and have already gone this way and that way because if at some point you went this way, if at some point you covered, you covered anything over here and ended up at Y, then how did you get up here and then get back to Y? Uh, it's not possible. So even more histories are now impossible. And we can say that actually either S equals Y or E equals Y. The, uh, the range of covered elements, either, either uh, you know, y is one of those things. So we can just make this, like, you know, call this, I don't know, um, y2. And y2, like, let y be our current position, and let y2 be the other position, whichever one that is. So now we are further reducing the state. And, and now, one more optimization, and we're, and we're, you know, and we're done. Uh, we can realize that this E doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter what our other position is. Uh, what really matters, if, if I'm at some position, if I'm at X and Y, like so, it doesn't actually matter, like, you know, imagine there were more columns. It, it doesn't matter if I started down here and I walked all the way up here, um, or if I started only here and walked all the way up here. Because either way, I can't go back this way. The thing that matters is the direction that I came from. What matters is that I came from below, which means my future solutions are constrained to going right and top, you know, up in the immediate future. Uh, however, if I had come from above, my choices would be to go either down or to the right. 
And there's one more direction, right? It could be that I just came from the previous column. And if that is the case, I have the choice to go up, I have the choice to go down, and I have the choice to keep going right. So now we see that for this problem, the most concise way to capture all of the required state is this. And, and now remember like the test we had earlier for ourselves, like if I know that this is my current state, is this sufficient to find out the optimal solution to, to the end of the problem? And yes it is. Because if I know where I currently am, and I know where I came from, thus the direction I'm forbidden in going, from that point, there is like a single well-defined solution to the end of the problem. If I know I came from below, then I know I can't go that way. My choices are going here or going here. And I can ask, what is the optimal solution for when I'm in that case? Okay, so it'll definitely be informative to try to write this recurrence. Uh, before I do that, I want to stop and take any uh, questions. Also just doing a time check. Uh, okay, uh, any questions uh, before I get underway? And we try to write the recursion for this formula. Remember, the first step is going to be write the recursion. Then um, after that, you know, I'll leave it to you to apply the dynamic programming cache because that's, like we said, it's just an automatic. It's, you know, you can follow a standard procedure to always do that. Um, we saw last time how to do that, and there's code samples of it, on it, of it on my you know, GitHub that I'll point you to. Um, and then we can talk about also like what would the bottom-up solution look like if you were to optimize this for bottom-up. But first, remember, first we always get the recursion, then the top-down solution, then the bottom-up solution. You don't have to actually explicitly fully write the top-down solution in, in code if, you're, if you already know you're going to go for a bottom-up. But conceptually, you should understand that the recursion can just be translated into a top-down solution, and you should calculate its time complexity and you know, be aware of what it is. All right. So uh, how should we do it? Well, in this case, your choices depend on d, right? Like what you can do at x, y, which direction you can go, it depends on d. So uh, in this way, it's, you, it's actually going to be easiest to just make it a bunch of like if statements. So basically, let's say that this equals, well, first of all, you always start by capturing g of x, y, right? Or y, x, or whatever. I just mean, you, you know, uh, whatever, like the grid value at x, y. So we only start by capturing that. And then in addition, we must add an amount depending on which case we're in. And so, you know, I'll say, okay, if our direction was, and this is basic, D is basically an enum. It's one of three directions. Okay, now we have to have some kind of convention for how we represent D. Let's say it is just like, uh, we're gonna use uh, the direction we came from. You know, you can say, you, you could instead make it like the direction you're going in, if you want. That would just be the inverse. So direction came from would be like left. We came from the left. Alternatively, you could use the went in direction, which is the inverse of that. You could say it's the right. You went right if you came from the left. Okay, let me uh, sketch this out. So we are saying that, for example, if you are here, x, y, we will also maintain a direction. So uh, basically, option one is you came from the, well, let's do, you came from up. So you, you basically came from here. Then what are your options? You basically are allowed to continue this way or this way, right? So basically then, you will take the max of, what is it? F of x plus one, y, and we have to set the direction correctly here. What direction will this be? You'll have, at this cell, you'll have come from the left if you take this, right? Uh, and now, uh, what if you go down here? You'll be at, uh, remember, we, we increase y in this direction, right? Uh, y is increasing in this direction. 
uh, and x is increasing in this direction. So uh, that means here you will have y plus 1. So f same x, right, y plus 1. And what direction will have come from? It will be the same direction, up. You'll have come from above, right? OK, so this is the case for that. Then you can have if d equals equals, um, uh, you, you could be coming from down, right? So down would mean that you have currently come from here. You have currently come from here. This is your past. And now you will be going, um, you will be going uh, either this way or this way, right? So if you have the down case, uh, then that means here you would have max, instead of this max, you would have max f of x plus 1, y left. This is the same case as before. Or f of x, this time y minus 1, as you go up, y decreases over here. Uh, and you'll have the same direction, you'll have come from down. Okay, so you'll have the max of these two things. And then finally, I don't want to write too low on the board, so I'll continue here. If, the, and this is the most complex case, if you came from here, right, I say forget, but forget just like the specific cells you visited. You don't forget that you came from here. Um, so if, if D was from the left, then you just are going to have three things in your max, right? You see how that is. Because after here, you actually have all three of these choices. So, so here, it's going to be max of f of, well, you still always, like this choice is always constant. It's like the same choice. You, you can continue going right, in which case you get this subcase. But here, we will tack on, uh, here we will tack on uh, two more choices which are like f of x. Well, it's basically these two cases, right? Uh, oh, sorry, wait, no, what am I saying? Uh, so, so this case is, uh, yeah, so, so, so if you go to x, y, and you came from the left, yeah, yeah, then you get either this case, which is uh, x, uh, y, plus 1, and you came from above, or, yeah, I said the right thing, it's, uh, or you go here, and then you came from below. And so you're going to have consider the max of all three of these choices. And either case, you, in all cases, you add this first. So basically, you add this, and then you add, you know, depending on which case you're in, you pick one of these to evaluate. Uh, you evaluate that, and that's your solution. OK, uh, so question. Why is this non-circular? Like, we always have to like, ask ourselves that. Like, are we sure this is non-circular? Well, uh, you know, keep in mind, well, first of all, if you, if you increase x, in the cases where you increase x, you really don't have to worry at all about it being circular, right? Because you can never decrease x, so clearly it's non-circular if you increase x. For cases where you, where you, where you um, uh, don't increase x, you have to be more careful. But notice that you increase y only when you're going up. So, so basically, if you're going up, you're in the same row, you can only get to other cases that are going up. Like if your direction is going up, unless you increase x, you can only get to other cases that are going up. And those other cases will have higher y value. So you can never get to a case where your state is the same. You can never get back to the same x, y, and direction. Because your direction is one of three things. If your direction is up, then you will either increase your x, in which case you're not getting back to the same value ever, or you will keep going, you, you will keep your direction as up and you will increase y, but since you can never change direction without increasing x, you will never, uh, you will never see another direction and you will always keep increasing your y, so there's no like, cir possible circularity there. Uh, same argument applies for down, uh, just, just you know, with the down, um, and for left, uh, well, same argument applies here, and here, you know, same arguments apply here and here. Uh, you, you, you basically say that uh, 
once you are going up, you can never stop going up in the same column. Once you're going down, you can never stop going down in the same column. Uh, so, you know, for a particular direction, you will always move y towards in, in just one direction until you finally transition to the next column, in which case, again, not circular. So, you know, reasoning about this, we can kind of see that, like, this is not circular. Uh, and eventually this is pushing us towards, within the same column, depending on which direction we've chosen, we're always pushing towards higher y or lower y, in which case eventually we will hit a wall and we will change direction. Uh, this is just a general formula. We also have to account for the base cases. So the base cases will be accounted in the same way, which is basically like when you go out of bounds, your value is negative infinity, uh, which will basically have the effect of excluding those values from the max. So that means if you're down here, you will always choose this, even if this is like deeply negative, because this is negative infinity if you go here. And that's just the easiest way, like conceptually, if it helps you, you can, you know, just insert explicit checks for being, you know, in the last row or last column, if that, like logically, that may, may make more sense. Um, but just, you know, a very, like conceptually, you just want to strike out from the max any function calls that would be out of bounds. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is just return, have them return negative infinity, then it'll be as if they weren't in the max. But if you want to be explicit about it, and before you call every function, you want to check these x, y parameters are in bounds, you can do that. It'll make your code more complicated. So this is the general case. Yeah, the base cases will be handled basically the same way as before. Out of bounds is infinite, and this last case just gets, just assigns this value and is done. When, when, you, when you get here. So the base cases are the same as in the previous problem, essentially. Uh, does this make sense? Uh, does anybody have uh, questions about this? I'll take some questions and then uh, uh, for just a couple of minutes and then we'll go on a break. Uh, so, uh, questions? Questions? Yep. Does it vanish up to represent the yeah, yeah, we, we, we talked about what the convention for the direction is. So to, a reminder is a direction of up, the direction is a parameter that represents where we came from. So when we say the direction is up, it means we came from above, and it means we're currently kind of like moving down. Well, so a direction of up would mean that we followed a path like so. Yeah, so we followed a path like so, and now our two choices are here or here. Make sense? It's just a convention. You, you can pick your own convention, but you're, you know, you're, you're, these will vary slightly. It'll be the same structure, but exactly the, para the parameters will vary slightly depending on the convention. And in that case, uh, D equal to left, uh, the second condition straight, come y plus one, come and down, right? Because we came from... Uh, uh, let's see. So, so if D is left, if we came from the left, then if we, uh, if we go up, then, then like this state, so, so if we came from the left and we choose to now go up, then we will have Y decrease by one and we will have come from below to this cell. That's why this is that. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, like if the convention is confusing to you, you can choose a different convention. Some people like like direction I just went in rather than direction I came from. I, I find the direction I am going, like having this notion of direction I'm going in can be maybe a little bit misleading because you might think if the direction I'm going in is below, that means I have to go down here, but actually I can go over here. But, you know, it's like, like if you want to say direction I'm going in as in like the direction I was going in right before I reached the state, then like linguist, like that is just a linguistic difference. That is the same. It's just like your directions will be inverted. Like you will say right where I said left. You will not even have a left enum value. Your enum value will be right instead. Uh, you know, and your top and down will be reversed. Yep. What is the direction for x, zero, y, zero? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, like, so what is like the, what is the initial solution case? Yeah, that's a great question. So clearly, uh, you know, clearly uh, we should call this with zero, zero, and then what? Yeah, that, uh, that's a great question. What do you think? Left. Left. 
Um, yeah, I mean, that would work too. You, you could take the max of all, but like z f of 0, 0 left um, actually works fine because that one is the most like, th that one is basically the most general, right? So, so if, you, if you pretend you came from the left, right, if you, if you pretend as though you came from the left here, you will say that like, okay, you are allowed to go here, here, and here. Now, in practice, you will never go there, of course, because this is out of bounds. But, you know, the left one covers the most cases, so like, why not? Um, alternatively, you could actually decide to, you know, make it this one, because clearly this has the two that you need. Uh, I think it's more kind of clear to make it be left. I mean, another thing that people do is like, you could actually take the max of all of them, and it will have the same result. The left one, the, the score for zero, zero left is actually guaranteed to be as good or better than the score for this one, right? Or, or this one. Like, why is that? Because the, this is just, the, this covers just more cases, right? This has the same value, but more cases. So, like, the left one will always have as equal or better of a score than the other ones. So, uh, it, you know, you could take the max of 0, 0, left, 0, 0, right, and 0, 0, uh, down. But that's not really necessary. 0, 0, left covers it all. And in this case, uh, 0, 0, left will actually make the same recursive calls. Well, if you strike out the one that is a base case and generates negative infinity, 0, 0, left will actually have the same result as 0, 0, uh, down, uh, 0, 0, up, where you came from above. So either one of those is fine. So we can just make it like so. Yep. So we have uh, seen the recursive formulation now. Where are we uh, kind of getting the overlapping subproblem help here? Yeah, yeah, that, okay. So that's a, good, that's a good question too. So the question is like, seeing this recursive formulation, where are the overlapping subproblems? Well, uh, okay, let's try to find them. And you, you know, there's not really like a much better way to, in general, find overlapping subproblems than just by, you know, trying to sketch out the recursive tree and spot them. Uh, but let, let's see. So let's say we start with 0, 0 left. I'll just denote it as L. Um, let, let's see. So, I mean, conceptually, I'm just thinking like, okay, if I start here, or sorry, if I start here, you know, here or whatever, um, after I go, like there would be some duplicate problem after I get to like this one one square, right? Because uh, I mean it's kind of it's kind of the same as before. Uh, like the number of subproblems here is only greater than the previous formulation we had before, right? So the paths that we had before are still valid. So you can still have a path that goes like this, and you can have, uh, well, okay, here they would actually be different because um, because you came from different directions. Uh, so let's see, um, I'm, I'm just thinking, what is like the simplest example? Like obviously if we sketch out this recursion tree, like we will eventually see an overlapping problem. It's, it's very easy to see that there must be overlapping problems here because uh, after all, we reduce this to only three times mn states, right? That's our time complexity essentially. Three directions, that's a constant, times mn. So we only have three <coughs> mn different states. But then we know that like, when we evaluate the problem recursively, the number of histories is actually like, very large, right? It's like exponential. So clearly we have some overlap. We, it, if we allowed the recursion, it would be like exponentially many branches. Uh, but we've reduced it to something that's like linear, three mn. So clearly, clearly there must be some overlap somewhere. But let, let, let's say, um, just begin, with the, just begin with the one that you had, but just go down on the second no, I think column, go down by two. The, the question is more towards, yes, yeah. we have an overlapping subproblem, but where are we caching that so that even if some other person comes, he gets that directly rather than actually doing oh. the calculation again? Well, this is like why you transform this recursion using the dynamic programming template. Like, you have to, like, this is just a recursion. You have to do the transformation to attach the cache. That's not, a, not directly indicated here. But remember, like, when we, when we already said that, like, when we have a recursion, it's just, like, an implementation detail to attach the cache. It's, it's always, like, the same process. There's no, like, creativity involved. Uh, it's just we will, we will essentially, before, before running this logic, for the function, we will check if this tuple, if this three tuple of x, y, and direction 
is already computed, and if so, we will evaluate it. This is just part of like the standard dynamic programming theory. Like, like all dynamic programming is going to work like this way. Uh, you, you write a recursive function, and then you figure out the expression for evaluating it, and then after that, you you know attach the cache in the standard way, the same way you do it for absolutely like any problem. So this is uh, you know uh, I guess you could review like the part one materials. So yeah yeah so, so so I think what you said about like finding the overlapping subproblem. I mean yeah I, I think you had an idea for how to find it here. So uh, if we make this um, here we go. We can find an overlapping subproblem, for example, uh, between this path and this path. Like if we, you see? So, so uh, th this would be the same subproblem if you got here via this path versus if you got here via this path. Then you would have a subproblem where you reach the same position from the same direction. And from here, the answer is the same. There is one unique, optimal way to get to the end that we can reuse between these two cases. Yeah. OK. Yeah, you can, I mean, if in doubt, you can always sketch out the recursion tree. Like, note that if you know that the recursion would be exponential, uh, and clearly the dynamic programming, you've reduced it to some linear state, then there must be some kind of deduplication of the cases, otherwise you would not be able to reduce it like this, if there was not. Yep? Uh, so why is that uh, you visited, uh, we don't go left? Like, uh, that was the condition of the problem. Oh, just finish. Okay. Yeah, the condition of the problem is you're allowed to go right, down, and up. Okay. Because going in all four directions would be too hard, is the answer. <laughs> yeah? Question about, the question about the looping. So you have three loops, if you want to go bottom, um, I haven't discussed bottom up yet. Okay. This is this is the top down solution. This is just the recursion, and then top down is you know you use the standard transformation to attach a cache to this. Ah uh, uh, yeah yeah ah uh, okay uh, yeah I mean I meant to do that separately, but yeah sure why not why not now? So what is the time complexity for this? So remember what is the formula? The number of states? How what what is the number of states? Uh, m times n times 3. 3 is a constant. So this, there are just order mn states. Uh, what uh, time is spent per state? So it's actually still order 1. It's more complicated logic than before, but it's still order 1. Because you count only the time spent inside this function, not the time. You, like, you count some constant for invoking a function because you, know, you have to set up a function call, but you don't count the time spent inside the function itself because that's counted separately. We're counting, we're basically for every function we're saying, let's count how much time we spent inside this version of the function with these parameters. And then we multiply that by the total number of different function calls. Uh, and last time we kind of gave like a rigorous justification of why that was justified. I'm not gonna repeat that. Uh, but I just wanna say, uh, okay, so, so what, all lo logic here is still constant time, right? Because in constant time, you choose one of these three cases. You take the max of three things. That's a constant amount of arithmetic. You take the max of either two or three things. Either way, that's a constant amount of arithmetic. Uh, you do some constant number of additions and passing of parameters. And you do some constant number of order one function calculations. So everything, and then you do some sum, some array access, whatever. But it's all order one, right? There's no loops here. So this is order one time per state. OK. So this gives us order mn overall. Now, we can also argue, can we not, that this is the optimal time complexity. Because simply reading the input is order mn. So I, you know, I, I won't do the full argument here, but as soon as we argue that, arguably, you have to read all or most of the input before you can know the answer, which you can make that case for this problem, that is true for this problem. You can show that if there's like some cell you haven't read. Well, OK, I'll do the argument just because it's so easy. Suppose there's any one cell you haven't read. Suppose you are deciding to not pass through that cell. What if that cell has like some incredibly valuable value? 
then your solution is not optimal. Suppose instead you haven't seen the cell, but you did decide to pass through that cell. Suppose it has some deeply negative number. Again, your solution is not optimal. So actually, you can never know the optimal solution if you have, if there's any cell you haven't looked at, you can never know the optimal solution. So at least order MN array accesses are definitely required for this problem. So this is the asymptotically optimal solution. Okay, and in terms of the work done, it's not too bad. Okay, uh, just one more thing before, uh, before we go on, which is just, I want to briefly discuss like what would be the bottom-up method here, so we can move off of this problem. Uh, so bottom-up, well, this is all the recursion. Um, I'll erase parts of it. I'll tr I trust that you can keep track of it. Oh, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe we should also ask, like, what is the space taken up by this program? How do we calculate the space? We, we didn't really look at space complexity analysis that much last time, but it's not very different from time complexity. Uh, how do you calculate the space complexity analysis of a dynamic programming problem? Number Just number of states, right? Number of states. I mean, in some like very extreme cases, there might be something special where uh, maybe like the amount of space computed consumed just temporarily inside the function is very significant, but that is like a very rare case, like assuming you're not doing anything crazy inside the function, uh, then the space is basically dominated by the size of the cache. So you have to ask, okay, so it, actually we should say it's the number of states multiplied by the amount of space per state. Now it's pretty rare for the amount of space per state to not be order one. Usually it's a number, but I mean in principle it could be an array or it could be some other type. In principle it doesn't have to be order one. So we should just keep that in mind. So like, it's actually common for the time to not be number one. In the very next problem, we're gonna see a case where the time is not number one, order one per state. So far, every problem we've looked at has had order one time per state. It's not, not always gonna be true. But space, almost always order one per state because we usually try to cache only, remember, we try to avoid caching sets, right? We try to cache integers, which means that uh, integers are like enums or whatever, which means that these things are small. So again, so order mn states, order one space per state, so order mn. Okay, let's go on to question. Uh, isn't it like three mn because of ds? Yeah, yeah, this is asymptotic constant notation. Mm -hmm. Constants are ignored in asymptotic notation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how would the, you know, just imagine you have the other case down here, it's not like really important for us to look at it right now. Uh, how would you do it bottom up? So remember, bottom up is just like you arrange the cases in some evaluation sequence. Uh, so instead of relying on the recursion to produce a valid sequence in which the calls are resolved and evaluated, the recursion is implicitly doing, like if you know graphs, like this recursion is actually implicitly doing what's called topological sort on the recursive cases. And you know, you don't have to think of it uh, that way, you don't have to think of how do you do topological sort when you do recursion, but actually it's completely equivalent to what's called DFS, depth first search topological sort. And that's what the recursion is doing implicitly. We covered this kind of theory last time that essentially that the, the recursion is implicitly ordering the function calls in a valid order by essentially applying the same procedure as depth first search topological sort does in graphs. But if you don't know about graphs at this point, that's fine. Uh, the important thing is that the recursion is doing the ordering of the cases for you. And in bottom up, it's basically our job to say how are the cases going to be ordered so that they're valid. So that whenever a case requests the solution to another case, we already have it in the cache. And then we can do away, away with recursion and we can only have caches and loops. Uh, so uh, what do we need here? Well, we have to kind of basically look at like what are the dependencies here. So uh, clearly at any time, we saw that any of these three cases can actually, you know, th there, there was one more here, right? I'm not gonna rewrite it, but just there's like a D equals equals left. We saw that in, in, in any of these three cases, we might invoke this one, right, x plus one. Like so, basically smaller values of x may depend on larger values of x. This suggests that essentially we're gonna have like a sweep order that better evaluate columns from right to left. 
Basically, any x here may depend on x plus 1. So we have to evaluate higher values of x first, so that when we evaluate x, we already have the value for x plus 1. OK, so first we agree that we're going to sweep from, uh, we're going to sweep right to left as far as, the, as far as the columns go. First, we'll evaluate this column, which only depends on base cases here. Uh, for, like, I'm, I'm talking about four of the cases that go right. We'll look at the other cases in a moment. Uh, but first, we've got to do this column, then this column, then this column, and so on, right? And at some point, we'll get that, like, this column x we have, but it depends on x plus 1, but we've already filled in this column. So when we are evaluating this one, everything is fine. Um, now, what about these other cases? So here it's a little more tricky, because here it's kind of direction dependent. So we see that for up, up is dependent on higher values of y. That means that when we populate the values for up, like we kind of have to do it separately. We're not going to like populate all the values for x, y at the same time. We have to kind of like take like, you know, uh, like let's expand the dimension of it. Like think of it, think of it this way. Like, think of it as, as conceptually being three grids, this being like the dimension 0, 1, or 2, right? So basically, if the problem is of size x by y, here we have some cache that is conceptually a grid. You can represent it as a map, or you can represent it as a 2D array. But we have a cache for up, we have a cache for down, and we, or, and we have a cache for left. Think of it as like, you know, this is the third dimension. This is the D dimension, right? Because now this is a three-dimensional problem. We have to like somehow have our cache represent three dimensions. This is how I'm showing it to you. Like we, we have up, down, like this is by x, y, by x, y, and we have left. You don't have to have it be three separate caches. You can, you know, have it uh, just be like another array dimension. You can even use like a 1D array to encode everything and do like array math, you know, like index offsets, whatever. But conceptually, this is what we have. So for all of these, we've agreed that we're going to evaluate the rows in this order, like, like this way. Right? This is to satisfy this x plus 1 data dependency. But depending on the direction, we have to go in different ways. So for d equals up, uh, a value of y depends on higher values of y. So for up, and remember, higher values of y are this way. Right? higher values of y are this way. So if, if this value depends on higher values of y, that means these ones we're going to sweep in this order. Like the sweep order here is like so. For down, it's actually the opposite because y depends on only on lower values of y. So for down, we have to sweep in a different order. Well, sorry, it's actually, it, it's actually still going right to left, so it's still going like this. And then for left, that's the most complicated case. But left, it, left actually depends on down and up. So that means that we first fill out these. Uh, we first fill out these, and then, uh, well, we still do it like one row at a time. So, so we are going to do it like one, one column at a time. So first we fill out this one, then we fill out this one, then we fill out this one. Then we fill out like this, 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 but in the order of this arrow. Uh, and so left will depend on some values here, some values here, and some values in the next column. But left, left can be any sweep order. You can sweep like this, or you can sweep in the other direction, because left doesn't depend on anything else. Le like this value over here in the left column, for example, if you look at what it depends on, this one depends on this, and it also depends on like uh, this one. And it all, or, yeah, let's see, you came from down, or, I, I don't have the recursion on the board, so, you know, I'm, I'm maybe getting confused, but I think it, I think it depends on, I, I think this value would depend on this cell over here, uh, because this, in this one you're, oh, no, no, okay, in this one you're coming from below, so yeah, I guess I was correct to say it was this one. Um, and then you, this one will also depend on, uh, this cell where you came from above. Uh, yeah, I, I think I got that right. But in, a, in any case, if not, like you can just figure out by like you know just rewriting this recursion, 
uh, you can figure out like which cells it's dependent on, and then you know that that basically decides the order. So the order here would probably be uh, always do like one column at a time. First, fill out like the rightmost column everywhere, then fill out the next column everywhere. But the key is that left depends on down and up. So you first fill out the up and down matrix. You first fill out the ups in this order, that they're, because like this cell will depend on this cell. So you have to fill them in this order. Then down, you fill them going this way, because this cell will like depend on this cell. Um, and then here, like this cell depends on this over here, which is already filled in, and some cells in here. So you have to do the left ones last. It's kind of, if, if that seems kind of complicated, this is like sometimes why people don't do uh, bottom-up dynamic programming. You know, you can just let the recursion order the cases for you. But if you insist, like you can find a sequence. You know, that's the sequence. It's not like conceptually difficult. It's just, you know, it's kind of hairy. Because the recursion is hairy and it has some complicated dependencies. So you can you do all of them space then in this case? Uh, yeah, you can. You you can. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into that detail now. Uh, sometimes for bottom up, you can like we said you don't usually improve the time complexity asymptotically. You may improve it by a constant factor. Usually, bottom up does not improve the time complexity asymptotically, but it may actually sometimes improve space complexity. And the the reason it it could in this problem is because you notice that the like if you're currently evaluating a column x x will only depend on x plus 1. And if you're evaluating the rows from right to left, it basically means that if I had some rows like x plus 2, x plus 3, I can kind of forget about these. I can discard these. And I can only keep the current row and the row before it. Or, well, the row I evaluated before it, so the one like that the one to the right of it. Or, sorry, column. I keep saying row when, I, uh, when I'm in, being column. Uh, yeah, so, so here we can, we can reduce the space complexity because we could actually just track at any given time the, the two last columns, the, the, columns we, the last two columns we evaluated. And in that case, we wouldn't need like order MN memory because we wouldn't need all like X, Y, D states. Uh, we would just need, uh, y you know, we would just need like two columns worth which, so it, the space complexity would be like, you know, if this is the m parameter, then it would be m times d, but again, d, number of directions is a constant, so it would be like order m for space complexity. For time complexity, it's still order mn, because you still have to evaluate each one. You're just kind of forgetting the rows as you go. Now, if you want to trace back the path, you still have to keep everything. Oh, by the way, how would you trace back the path with any of these? So it's actually pretty simple, right? Like if you want to recover the path, uh, it seems like we only got, got the value, but how, how could we get actually like what path we took? Well, I, I mean, for any particular cell, we know that we only came from one of three possible cells, right? So, so after we've computed the best answer at each cell, like let's say I know, uh, let's say I know the best answer at this cell. Like let's say that from here to reach the end, the best value is 50. I know that somehow through some sequence, whatever, uh, I get the value 50. Um, well, you know, uh, okay, imagine this doesn't, yeah, you know, this is some satisfying sequence. Uh, so imagine here I get, the, you know, imagine here I know that this path is worth 50. And this is the best path. Imagine I know that. And, uh, And uh, now I, I want, you know, I would like to recover, recover the path. What I can do is um, I can, uh, well, I, I can look at each of these three directions I could have gone in, and like, let's say I know this value is four, right? Let, let, let's say I know the value at this cell is four. That means wherever I continue, it has to have a value of the remainder, 46. So if the, you know, if the best value from this point is 50, and I know the value of the current cell, I know that I continued with something that was worth a total path of 46. So I would just look at you know, the different ways I could have gone, like if these were my options, like if I, I'll see what my options were, depending on what direction I came from, and if I see that you know, I could have gone this way, this way, or this way, like let's say here I had to come from the left. 
uh, then I will just see which of these has a path that is valued at 46. So in this case, it will be like, it will be that this path starting here will be worth 46, right? Because the path is worth 50 starting here. Uh, but, you know, if I go in a different direction, it may be that the best path starting here is only worth 40 because I didn't go in the optimal direction. Uh, so I can only just recover it by doing it this way. I can also just compute the answer, like, as I go. Uh, that, that's kind of another option. Uh, be, be, because, like, what I, what I can always do is uh, I, I can just include that as part of my answer. So, so far, like, all of our answers that we put in the cache have been just, like, a single number, like the best value. But there's nothing stopping me from putting a best value and a direction of progress. Like, I can make the answer to the recursive function, I can make the return type of f the function, I can have, say, the return type is a two-tuple of the value and the direction. And then, you know, I would have to adjust my recursive formula. It wouldn't be a big adjustment, though. I would just, you know, uh, I, I would just, you know, have to, have to like make some small adjustments to preserve the direction. I would, it would basically be like, okay, if, if this was the element you picked in the max, then it is this one, otherwise it is this other one. That might make your maxes less of a pleasant, like, you know, max of three things and more like kind of hairy if-else statements, like, because you have to say like, okay, if you took this, then, then, you know, the direction you want to return is this one. If you took this one, then, you have to return that one, yeah? So what if two of those things have the same value? Would it be possible that... The if two of them have the same value and they're both valid, then that means that either they were a tie. Like if you can, if this path is worth 46, and this path is valid and also worth 46, then they were both just equally, they were both contributing. Like, like, like this one is worth 46 and this one is worth 46, you had two ways of getting 50. You had, you had a tie for the optimal value. And then when you recovered a path, you know, it would be up to you, if, like, which one you want to pick. Whether you have any preference or, you know, you just want to, like, you know, pick the, pick the first one. Okay. Uh, I, I want to spend the rest of the time on, uh, you know, an interesting follow-up on this problem. Which is, you know, you might think, okay, like, more follow-ups? Like, already this is a follow-up on the previous problem. Already this has gotten hard, but don't worry, it's about to get harder. <laughs> uh, so, uh, now, you know, and this is like the final variant of the coin, co coin bulldozer, coin collector, whatever problem will do, is uh, now you are actually allowed to shuffle back and forth. Remember before you were forbidden from going back to a cell you visited? Now you are allowed. The only thing is, the second time around, you do not pick up the coin a second time. So you basically can only get credit once per coin. Uh, or, you know, once, like the first, your first visit to a cell is what gives you the coins, positive or negative. Second time around, it's always worth zero. So you can shuffle around all you want, but you can't increase your total that way. However, this ability to shuffle around does improve the solution, potentially. It has the potential to lead to some solutions that were not possible before that score higher than before. Um, so every solution that was legal before will still be legal now. You're still allowed to go up, down, uh, and to the right. You're still not allowed to go left. Uh, however, now you are also allowed to shuffle back and forth all you want. So th this already, like this description, should suggest to you that we will need like additional history, right, to maintain which cells we've already collected. Like, we should maintain additional history to know, like, which cells we've already harvested. Otherwise, we can't properly, like, attribute ourselves with credit. Uh, because when you visit a cell, now you will need to, like, say, like, are you collecting its value or no. Remember, before, we always had this g of x, y term where we would unconditionally collect the value of the cell. That can't be unconditional anymore. Okay. So... Um, let's say, uh, like, first of all, like, why can you get a better payout? Well, let's assume that there is some column that only has, like, one 
we'll call it like designated crossing zone. You know, so basically there's some value where you get a chance to cross, but everything else has like a huge negative value. So here it actually matters that you can have negative numbers, and in the previous problem it did too, because obviously the best solution if all numbers are positive is just snake around and collect everything. Right? Uh, you, could, you don't need dynamic programming to find that out. Uh, but here, like look at this. So actually this means this is essentially a bottleneck. Like, assuming these numbers are so big it makes the rest of your solution mostly irrelevant, you can see that there can be a situation where you are forced to pass through the cell. Any optimal solution will pass through that cell to get to, to, to cross the boundary and eventually get over here somehow. Right? Everything will have to go through there, like so. And maybe you do some fancy stuff over here, but eventually you have to cross here. Now, in the previous circumstances, like, let's say you were here, right? Let's say you are in this cell. You are currently here. And let's say there's a very, very juicy value here. You cannot pick it up, right? Because if you go here, now you're trapped, right? You must now take this. Because you can't, you can't go back. But here, you would actually be able to pick it up, come back, and then cross. So that's why it's possible that now we will have even better solutions than before. Does that, does that make sense? So, you know, this kind of clearly shows like how it's possible. And why this problem is different. Now, and you can see why this problem is like a little more complex. Because now it's not really enough to have just a direction you came from, right? Because, because even if you know where you came from, it's possible you could still go back in that direction. So clearly you need some kind of information about, like, even if I know that I'm here and I came from here, I need to know, like, what down here I have picked up. Because maybe I could still come back to it. Maybe I could still come back some way over here and pick up some more values. Okay, so let's start with kind of the most, like, obvious idea here. Um, so, uh, like, the first question you have to ask is, like, what is essentially, like, the history that must be captured by variables. Where's B on, where's B on that column? Hmm? Where's B on that column? Well, okay, so, so probably like start with x, y. I mean, you know, as we'll see, maybe like not even x, y, but uh, it's a reasonable start. You know, like it makes sense to keep your track of like where your position currently is. And then, you know, you have to, you, okay, the, it's clearly by like s the same arguments we made before. Like we could go through the same process we did before where we keep a state of everything. But already it's clear like some of the arguments we made before for improving the performance apply, right? We don't need this column. We don't even need a set of everything in the current column. Um, because it's clear that in the current column, the visited values must still be contiguous. Because the only way they could not be contiguous is if you like, went to the next column, did some stuff, and then came back, but that's not allowed. So everything you do in the current column is necessarily continuous. Uh, so that means that the complete set of history can be captured by something like this. Now, it, it'll turn out that maybe this is not the best representation. And this is why, like, th this is why, you know, dynamic programming is complex. And this is, like, what we discussed in the session last time, we said, you know, how can something so easy, just transforming recursion, be so difficult? Uh, and it's because we have to find ways to express the recursion in the best way for dynamic programming, in the way that will allow us to benefit the most from this optimization of attaching the cache. And how do we know how much we gain from attaching the cache? Well, you know, usually the recursion is exponential time, but the time complexity of the dynamic programming solution is order of number of states multiplied by the time per state. So we always use that to see how good our solution is. What is that hmm? What is that Start and end. Okay, okay, so, so basically it'll be uh, like this. Uh, X is this, X is this, Y is this, and S and E is basically the starting and ending point of everything you've picked up in the current column. So for example, if you are here, then your Y is this, your X is, your X is this, your Y is this, 
And if you've also already picked up this value and this value, then your, um, then your start will be here if you've already like, picked up this 100 and it's gone. And if you've picked up this, it'll be here. And now you're here, so, so like your end will be here. You've, you've already passed this contiguous block. And now you're here. Now you might, um, one thing you have to like agree on, kind of like by convention, but as, as you'll see, like maybe some definitions are easier to work with than others, is should this start to end range? So we'll always assume S is like less than or equal to E. Uh, like start will be the lower, the lower Y, the smaller Y number, so the one that's higher on the board because Y goes in this direction. So S will be the one that's higher on the board, the one that has the lower Y. And, the one, and E will be the one that has a higher Y is um, lower on the board. Um, so S to E will be the range. It'll be, let's say, like, you know, you can take your pick of convention for like half ranges or whatever else. Here we will say that it's inclusive on both ends. It includes both S and E. And now with the one final point we have to decide here is, uh, does the history include the Y value itself? So for example, if our history is that we picked up this value, we picked up this value, and now we're here, is that going to be f of x equals 1 in this column, y is 0, 1, 2, 3, is it going to be f of 1, 3, and then s equals you know, 1, and e equals 2, or is it going to be f of 1, 3, 1, 3? Why, why, why 3? Because you know, like, include this in the history as well. So, so, uh, uh, zero, one, sorry, zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three. So, you know, should this be represented as one, three, like, this part is unambiguous, right? Uh, should the history be represented as one, two, or like one, three? So we can find that actually it will be better to represent as uh, 1, 2, like this, not including the current value. And why is that? It's actually because uh, when, when we reach a cell, we need to know, like, do we collect it or not, right? So this is, would actually be kind of an ambiguous representation if we chose this. Because then we would be saying, like, okay, our history is that we've already covered 1 to 3, and our current value is 3, but does, does that mean we collected it or we didn't? Uh, you, you see we've lost some information here. So this kind of seems like a subtle point, and I wouldn't expect people to kind of see that right away. But when you start implementing, you may find that like, you prefer this formulation because now you can write the correct recursion. Uh, if, if the history doesn't include your, path, your current value, only then do you have the information to know whether your current value is new or not. If your history always includes the current value, then you don't know if the current value is new, and you don't know if you should pick up the, pick up the value at the cell. Like if there's some value here, like 20, do I add that to my total or no? Right? Okay, so we prefer this representation where the history does not include. Why don't you just get rid of y altogether? Why do you need y? Uh, you keep giving away, you know, my plans. <laughs> uh, it's because we haven't gotten to that point yet. Uh, yes. Uh, so, in fact, we will see that y is bad here. It's, it's actually kind of like not good that you have this y here. But, um, okay, how would we write this recursion? <laughs> f of x, y, start and end. Um, well, first of all, we have to figure out whether the current value is something that should be added to the total, right? So we have to take some logic like this. Basically, if y, so if y is not in this range of s and e, it basically means y is like either one on top of the range that's been covered, right? Like if in a column, a particular range has been covered, like from here to here, it means that the current y, it can't be like out here somewhere. It is either like sitting on top, or it's sitting at the bottom, or it's like somewhere smack in between of the range. So th this case where we should add the current value, to, it, it corresponds to basically this. We can say, we can, we can basically do this test. This is like a ternary 
uh, I'll denote this like a ternary operator and say like y, if y is less than s or y is greater than e, then, you know, then we add this value of g x y, we pick it up. Otherwise, or sorry, I mean like this. Otherwise, we get zero. So, so this is basically just the logic of like, have you been to this cell before? If yes, pick it up, otherwise no. Okay, then you have to move to that cell. Or, or rather, then, then you have to make a choice of like what to do next, right? And so here, um, you know, we have, we, once again, uh, like after picking up the value, we have three choices. So uh, what are our three choices? So, so like this is just picking up the value. Uh, this is separate, and then we add the max of three things, right? And just to, you know, I'm trying to get through this quickly because this isn't really the solution I want us to focus on, but um, like what are some of the things we should add in the max? Uh, we should add f of, you know, if we go up, then it will be like f of x, uh, y minus one, and then these S and E expressions, what, what will they be? Uh, one way you can do it is you can, you can do it kind of like this. Min, Y, and S. This is basically saying that if Y was smaller than S, so like, you know, you were in this column, here was S and E, and Y was actually above here, then you have to expand S to cover that. So the new argument of S will be the min of Y and S. And for E, like similar logic applies, max of Y and E. Um, no, y. Uh, y, y is the parameter, like S and E both relate to a Y coordinate. There's no reason it would be X. It's, it's like max of Y and E. This is saying that if your Y is here, then your new E is like Y now. But you have the plus one. This kind of does it, right? Uh, like th this already, already covers that because this is saying like if y was less than s, then make it the new y. Yeah, so this kind of already covers that. The plus ones happen in this column. Yeah. And then uh, the next expression will be f of x, y plus 1. And then the same ones, like just ditto, 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 uh, same one. And then uh, we can do the case where we go to the right, which is x plus 1, y. And here we run into a little difficulty, which is just, you know, this is par for the course for dynamic, complicated dynamic programming problems. We run into a little difficulty, which is uh, uh, when we move to the new column, right, we actually have no history. So we don't actually have a way of representing that. But okay, we can, we can kind of hack our way around it. What, what we can say is that when I move to a new column, instead, of, I, I will actually go ahead and like right away count its value. <laughs> So, so if I move to a new column, I will, you know, go ahead and add g of x plus 1y here, or something. I will add g of x plus 1y. So I will add this column, and then I will, like, give it a history so that it doesn't pick up uh, new, any new values. So see, when this column is evaluated, it will pick up 0 here. Uh, so this is just kind of a hack. Like, we could think of other ways to resolve it. We could pass in, like, a special marker parameter. We could pass in negative 1s. There might be like different ways to resolve it. We can pass in some marker parameters, but the problem here you see was that when you move to a new column, technically your history in that column is blank because your history doesn't include the current position according to our convention. So how do you represent that? You either have to have some kind of special convention and special check, but this works too. You could just award its value right away and then give yourself a history of one so that you don't pick up the value again. I think this is probably the most elegant way to do it, but there's so many different ways that you could do this that I don't venture to say that for sure this is the most elegant way to do it. How will this end up being the zero? Sorry? Oh, because this call, this call won't meet this check. It's kind of like normally, okay, so normally we award the value when we make the call. But here we kind of have to, we like, saying no history is not a valid argument. So instead we like kind of muck with it a little. We insert like a one element history, but then we award its value as well so that, you know, we don't miss out on the value. 
So like th this is included as part of the max. It's max of these like three terms. Uh, now, th there's a problem here. This doesn't work. This is completely wrong. Uh, why is it wrong? And this is what I mean, like, circularity is not like always the easiest thing to spot. So this formula, unlike, say, like, remember how we gave this formula in the beginning of, like, we gave a similar formula at the beginning of the previous problem, right? And then we said it's wrong because it doesn't respect the constraints. So here we actually have a more subtle problem. Which is that not really that it's not the, the problem is not really that we haven't respected the constraints. Like in some sense, this formula, or I mean at least assuming I didn't make like a dumb mistake, this formula should be true. Like in, in like a mathematical sense. But you know what else is true in a mathematical sense? Like f of x equals f of x. Like this formula, it's like it's not necessarily false. It's just you cannot use that formula to make progress on the problem, right? And this is now the problem we have here. Because what is this formula actually allowing? The problem is this is allowing endless shuffling back and forth. Like what this formula is allowing is basically if you are in this state, x, y, s, e, and you have like some like history through this s and e parameter, and you have some current position x and y, if s and e are both like, you know, if your y is like in the middle of the s and e, Right? If, uh, if your situation is that, now that I've explained the problem, uh, I don't think we need this for a while, but if your situation is that, you know, for some x and some y, you are here, but your s is this parameter, and your E is this parameter, that means you've collected everything in here. Now watch what will happen with these equations. X of Y, that's this cell right here, this will call this, the, well, like whatever is stored here, and whatever is stored here. And these parameters will stay the same, right? Like, like if your Y is between S and S, then min Y S, uh, so, so like X Y, uh, you know, whatever, S, E. Like in this case, for these values, it will call X, Y minus one, S, E. Um, and then eventually this case will call back, you know, using the plus one now, it'll call X, Y, S, E. And you have a circularity. You have a recursion that shuffles back and forth. And good news, it's not getting the wrong answer. It's, you know, like after it shuffles back, it will, it, it will do the right thing here. It will, it will see, like, it keeps awarding itself zero as it visits cells that it visited before. You've correctly captured that bit of history. You've correctly know that, you know, that uh, you, not to award yourself any points for this. But the problem is now that you're shuffling back and forth infinitely with no end in sight. So this is actually circular. So one way we can improve it, and this gets us to a pretty good solution for this problem, is sometimes, you know, less is more. So you can ask, why do we even need this y? Uh, like, what is the y doing for us? It, it actually doesn't matter what y position we're in, right? It's because, like, it doesn't matter to me if I'm, if, like, if I know that I've collected all the values from here to here, you know, I don't care if I'm here or I'm here or I'm here. These values are like a blank tape. I can shuffle back and forth all I want. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that I'm here or here or here. As long as I'm in this range, all my answers are the same. I can shuffle back and forth all I want. And then when I'm ready to go on, I'll have to go on to one of these cells in this range. So now we can actually exclude some information and keep only the information we need, and that will actually remove the circularity if we're smart. But, you know, this is why I bring up this problem. It's really good to see that, like, you know, sometimes, like, it's not a, maybe not immediately obvious that your definition is circular, but it is. Even if you respect all the constraints, maybe your definition is circular. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta watch out for that. Okay, so let's, see a better definition. And this will get us to a pretty good solution, and then we'll see an even better solution. And that's what we'll conclude on. Um, OK, so f of x, s, and e, how can we express this? OK, so choice number one is you can go up here. 
So, so oh, okay, first let's give a definition for this function. This is the best solution, this is the optimal solution that gets to the end if you are currently at position x, if you are currently in row, uh, sorry, column, if you are currently in column x, and uh, you have collected every row number between s and e. Uh, you have already collected everything between s and e, and so there is not going to be uh, any more values to collect there. All the values are already laid out in S and E. All right. Um, but the values outside of this S and E range are not laid out. So what are your choices? You can either expand by one in this direction. So, so basically, there's no like grid term here right now because you've already collected the values in this range according to the definition. Okay, so your choices. <coughs> Let's do a max. Okay, so you take the best of these three choices. Either you expand the range. So if you expand the range by you know, covering one more cell to the top, then your S turns into S minus one. And you, well, at first you pick up, you pick up you know, because you were outside of this range, you now have to pick up this value. What is the value? Uh, it's X, S minus one, right? Again, this is the general case. You can fill out, fill in the base cases later. It's always important to write the general case first because sometimes on writing the general case, you will discover that you don't even want to go forward with this recursion, right? Like we wrote the previous general case and we were like, wait, this is circular. Uh, so don't even like bother with like details like the base cases until uh, you've actually established that like you, you can write a meaningful general case for your recursion. Uh, okay, so g of x and s minus one. Um, and then, what do we want to add here? Uh, we want, uh, you know, we, we, we want to make some function call, right? And now it's going to be x, s minus 1, and e. Right? Because now, you know, that, that, how, that's how our state gets updated. Okay, great. Uh, now one more argument. g, x, S plus E plus one, sorry, E plus one. This, is, this corresponds like we, we have already covered all the elements in this range, right? And now we would like to pick up, you know, this additional cell, this one, right? Want to get this one. So this is this value plus F of X, S, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, S, E plus one. Okay, good, you're all following. I see, I see that, that's good. Okay, and then finally, what is the, la what is the last case? Now, this one is more complex. If you think this one's so easy, like, maybe not. Yeah, it has to be a for loop. Right, right? Uh, why, because I don't have like a Y anymore, right? So how can I go right? Actually, here, going right means that you pick any of the options you have and you go right on those options, on each and every one. Because you don't know like what your y is, right? You just have a range. You have a range of an s and e, and you're able to go right on any one. So conceptually, you have like as many choices as there are possible values in the range s and e to go right on. Like if this is my range, I can pick any one of these and say I want to go right over here. OK, so now there's, there's a, an additional for loop of choices. Ah, so maybe it won't be order one per, per case now. Uh -huh. Uh, so, uh, how, how do I represent my choices? Well, what is one choice? One choice looks like, you know, we're gonna uh, we're gonna pick up the value x plus one k. Let k be the y position I chose. Like, let k be the y that I choose to go forward here. This is k. So, g x plus one k is my choice. I, I give myself this value. And additionally, I must now add the best solution from that value, which is what? It's f of x, k, k. Because my range is now k. Like when I go to the new row, I have updated to x plus 1, but my range is now just this one cell in this row. So from k to k inclusive. And, but, but this is basically, these choices are in a loop. This is for k from s to e. I can take anything from s to e, and I give myself this choice. So the max includes two 
kind of hard-coded items and some dynamically generated options from a, from a for loop. How do you do that in code? Well, it's simple, you know, first just take the max of this, like max can be broken down, right? You could, like a max of all of these is a max, max of this max and this max. So, you know. Wouldn't that one be x plus one? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot the plus one, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's plus one. Good, you're paying attention, yeah, plus one. Ah, uh, I thought I already wrote the plus one, but I guess I didn't. Yeah, so, so there we go, there we go. Um, so does this formula make sense to everyone? Like we're gonna take the max of all of these terms. It's because now our state, like, like usually previously we thought of a state as being like some specific position possibly with some extra information, right? But now we're saying like specific position doesn't matter. What matters is the column you're in uh, plus the range of items you've already picked up. So basically you have a precise X location like this is your x location, you have a precise x coordinate, but then, you know, you kind of exist in this like, I don't know, quantum superposition here, right? Where like, you know, you're, you kind of don't know where you are between s and e and it doesn't matter. And we saw that uh, actually trying to track the y variable, like maybe there's some tricks we could do to make it non-circular, but we actually saw that the y variable was kind of harmful because it was kind of creating this circularity. Uh, but now, you know, we got rid of it, and, you know, maybe we no longer have a circularity. Let's see if we do. Um, because previously, we had to, like, specifically account for changes to the y variable. <coughs> now we kind of don't. So actually, why is this not circular? Well, first of all, if you get into this case, you're referencing strictly higher values of x. You can still never go to lower x, so these are clearly fine. Like, these cannot be circular. Uh, because you have this call, right? Like, this is not circular. Uh, how about uh, can, how about these calls? Well, actually, if you note, uh, if you look at the difference, e minus s, e minus s always grows. To return to the same case, you would have to go to a case where the like if, if it's the same case, then e minus s will be the same. Like if you just calculate this e minus s, right, you will see that these are that that this is like some value. E, e minus s, but like it always grows as you call, make these calls. So that means you never get back to the same case. Um, another way to see it is like instead of doing s and e, you could do like x, s, and l, where l is a length. And then e equals s plus l. So you know, like just a different encoding of the parameters, right? Where uh, basically instead of having a start and an end, you have a start, and you have like how long you go from the start. And then in that case, you would see that L is always increasing unless you get into this case where you increase X. So basically, one of X and L is always increasing. From that, you can prove that like, this is not circular. So see, you have to be very careful to write things in a way that you are clear you are making progress. Uh, I mean, I know all this stuff is like kind of complicated. Like, like you know, I have no illusions about it. It's like this is not like easy stuff. The concepts are simple, but the application, as you can see, is kind of difficult. And you know, this is why I keep coming back to it. It's important to do these techniques that I keep you know mentioning. Um, you know, the ones that where you you know actually try coding these problems because. Like, I think if you successfully code the problem, like, after having been exposed to the principles and you understand, and you really derive the code logic from your own understanding and not from, like, copying somebody else's code, um, you, like, if you actually successfully code this, then you really understand the problem. Uh, and you really understand the concepts and how to apply them, not just the theory of it. Because the theory is simple, just cash stuff, right? And that's all. Okay. So uh, now, uh, th but I mean, this is actually all there is to like the general case of this recursion. Uh, you know, we can ask like, what, okay, like two questions that always have to arise is, uh, what is, you know, the base, what are the base cases, right? What are the base cases? And uh, also, you know, you have to ask like, what are the, uh, what is the starting condition, right? Like. Okay, so the starting condition here is pretty easy to write, right? I mean, because before, at first, well, so it's actually this plus give yourself the value of the first cell. Like, don't miss, don't miss this part, right? You'll probably see it pretty quickly in a unit test or something if you, if you get this wrong, but don't forget to give you this value because this function actually doesn't cover that. Like, this function is basically the best you can do 
if you are in column zero and you, your current range is zero, zero, which would imply you already picked up this cell in this formulation. So here, don't forget to give yourself this value. Um, but then, you know, it's just this. Okay, uh, starting condition was easy. Okay, starting condition was easy. How do we, um, uh, and what are the base cases? Well, again, okay, so if x goes out of bounds, return negative infinity. And if you are in a range where, uh, uh, so, so, so we have to do something for, you know, this like uh, final value. So you could say that, you know, if, uh, I mean, there's different ways to do it, but you could say that, for example, if you have f of uh, x and x is the x max, this is like the final column. You could say that if you have s and then this is the y max, so you basically have like some starting value. You, you can say if you have like some starting value of the column and this is the last column, so this is the goal, like this is the goal, and you have some starting value here, and you have some, uh, and your end value is already at the goal, so you've already kind of like picked up the goal essentially. Uh, then you have like one additional choice here, which is to return zero. You have the option to exit, or you have the option to go up here and pick up some more values. I mean, exactly what your options are depends on your interpretation of this problem. You have to clarify, like, if you touch the goal, are you allowed to still go back? Or are you, like, done as soon as you touch the goal? If you are done as soon as you touch the goal, then this case should just be zero. Uh, because, you know, you have no further payoff from here. If you are, like, like basically, if you just touched the, the goal, and you've already collected some range here, and you just got to the goal, then, uh, you know, this case is zero. Or if you're still allowed to go back, pick up some more stuff, and only then exit, then it would just be an option that you would add. Like, you would still have this choice of going S minus one and picking up some value there, uh, but maybe, you know, you also have the choice to exit and return zero. <coughs> In any case that's out of bounds returns infinity, so you won't do it. It'll be excluded from the max. Negative infinity, yeah. Okay, so, this is, so how about time complexity? I think it's nice to see like the time complexity here. Uh, what is the time complexity? Um, okay, uh, let, let's do it. Uh, okay, so first of all, how many distinct states? Number of states. Uh, okay, so 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 uh, we assume that like x is parameterized by m, and uh, uh, I think that's the parameterization I used before, right? X corresponds to m, and y corresponds to m. Uh, okay, so uh, how many values of x? So this is m, right? M possible values, or plus one, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, S mm -hmm. is n, right? Uh, you know, it's a y value. And this is also n. Okay, so m n squared states. Now multiply by the time per state. Ah, now tricky. Now this is tricky. It's not over one, right? Because you have a loop. So what is actually the time complexity of this? So we see each loop operand, like or every expression that's evaluated loop. This is order one. But the loop itself will operate up to under order n values. So the overall time complexity of this big max is order n. And so we have to multiply by n. It's this many states multiplied by this time per state. So we will get the time complexity of n, n cubed. Actually, I think, uh, I, I mean, I may have swapped which ones are n and which ones are n relative to the last problem. Is that n because of the for loop? Or? Yeah, exactly. So this is number of states. Like, let n be the number of y coordinates and let n be the number of x coordinates. Sorry, I think in the last problem I actually had the, uh, uh, whatever, let's make it consistent with the last problem. So last problem I said m is the number of y coordinates and n is the number of x coordinates. I, I think I did at least. Uh, so then the number of states here will be m, uh, sorry, the, 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 it'll be like n, m, n. So this is m squared n, and then this parameter will be n, and then we'll get kind of here. We'll get, we'll get this. So for a problem so complicated, this is not a bad time complexity, actually. Like, we can do better, but this is not a bad time complexity. 
Uh, yeah, so this is number of states. Uh, and this is time per state. Okay. Uh, because because every, every different state still needs to evaluate a for loop of possibilities. All right, now we can still look for ways to optimize this. Often when you have loops, you look for like commonalities between loops evaluated by different subcases. But um, I, I would, uh, you know, I want to conclude by showing like a better, just a better approach in general, like a different technique, a different way of thinking about the problem that allows a neater recursion to be written. Uh, so, and how will we know that this recursion is better? We will see that it has like essentially uh, fewer parameters. Uh, and, and the evaluation of each parameter is, you know, about equally, or each state will be about equally complicated, and then we'll be able to kind of estimate the time complexity of something better. Uh, by the way, what is the space complexity here, space? Uh, it's actually order m squared n, right? It's the number of states. Number, amount of space per state is still order one, because we're still already sorting a value, or maybe like a value in a direction if we want to recover the path. That's still all we're storing per, you know, per state. Okay. Okay, uh, so now let's see a better solution. Or, you know, it's possible maybe this solution could be optimized to something similar. But I just want to kind of present a different mode of thinking about it. You, you, you could get, so far, our thinking has been coming from this kind of like mindset that we have in the X and Y. Um, and even this, where we eliminated the Y, we are still kind of having Y information here. <coughs> Uh, but what if we kind of shift our thinking and not even like focus so hard on y? So ironically, we will actually end up with f of x and y when we use this approach. We'll get rid of the s and e and we'll put a y back in. But how will it happen is the interesting thing. Uh, so conceptually, I want to kind of eliminate y from my thinking. And here's kind of how I'm going to do it. So I'm thinking the structure of this problem goes like this. Is, imagine that essentially I pick some column here. Like what I mean by pick some column is, I, or rather, I'm given a column number, like I'm in column zero, and I pick some column. Like I have the cons special constraint for like the first column that my column must start at zero. I'll have a different constraint later, as we'll see. Uh, but let's say I picked some column, so I picked to include all of these values. That imposes a certain constraint about how I pick column number one, right? When I ask, how would you like to pick column number one, when I'm asked this, I, don't, I can't pick any column number one. I'm not allowed to pick this, right? They have to connect. So it essentially means that whatever choice I made here, it has an implication for what I'm allowed to connect to. So I'm thinking of it kind of this way. Let me build one column at a time. Let me, uh, let me think of my primary parameters essentially being x. And at every x, I want to pick a column, but my choice of column has to respect some constraints. So actually, one of the ways of doing this would lead back to something like, just like this. I could make s and e, I could actually make S and E some amount of history which describes the last column. So for example, if I pick this column and then the last column, I could call this parameter S and this parameter E, and then I could call this parameter of my next column, I could call this X. And I could end up with a pretty similar equation probably by, it would actually end up being something very similar, just like plus, you know, di different by like plus ones, minus ones maybe. Uh, if I, just go, if I just say I want to write an equation based on x and this history of s and e. So that would be like another way to derive something similar to this. But how about this? I say I actually want to sort of redefine my function so it is what I will call history free. Uh, this means that essentially I will now give a new definition to what it means to be f of x, y. Remember like a long time ago we kind of rejected this idea that we would have an f of x and y, because we know that just simply knowing that your current position is x and y is not enough. Um, but here's what I want to do. 
I, I'm going to define f of x and y like this. I'm going to say that f of x and y is the best payoff I can get if I am at position x, y, I am at position x, y, so I'm thinking kind of like columns at a time. I'm processing this x column. But I'm at position x, y, and I furthermore have the information that I just transitioned to this column. Like in other words, I am history free in my current column. So f of x, y is not just the result of any x, y. It specifically refers to a particular x, y. It refers to the state where I am at position x, y, and furthermore, I know that I have visited nothing in my column except my current cell. Because I'm at x, y, and I know that I furthermore additionally just transition. That's the definition of this function. Uh, and so, now this is perfectly fine as long as I can express my, you know, target value, that's like the value I want to get in the end, and I can, I can express this in terms of other calls to f of x, y that satisfies the same definition. Before we were afraid that we couldn't satisfy the same definition, but let's try it now. It'll actually work. So I, I want to make sure that any calls I make to f here have to satisfy the same definition, that I am new to the column. But this goes perfectly with what I was saying, like with this one column at a time thinking. So basically, I, I will do this. f of x, y will never make calls to the same x. f of x, y will only reference the next column, which means that when we reach that column, we will be history free in that column, and we will satisfy the definition re required here. So, uh, if, okay, if I'm at x, y, there is some transition I want to make to the same column, the next column. So when I reach x plus 1, <coughs> right, uh, when I reach x plus 1, I, would, I need to be somewhere in that column. Like, let's say I am here. This square, like, I'm not saying I jump from here to here. I'm not allowed to do that. I'm, I'm saying that... Uh, If this is column x, and this is column x plus 1, and this is y, I'm saying if I'm currently here, uh, let me kind of choose a transition area. So like I will, trans I will decide that I will start off the next column here. This is my one column at a time thinking. I'm thinking, when am I going to hop into the next column? So I choose a transition here. Uh, and now, uh, I'm basically saying, okay, I want to express this in terms of f x plus 1, k, where k is this choice. k is this choice of the y at which I'm going to make this transition. So, uh, what does it mean? Like, what is this expression? Uh, so, I have to try all possible k now, not just one like s to e. I don't have s to e. So, this is like max over all k from what, from like 0 to y max, this is all y. You have to try over all y. And we are saying that the total, if I start at position x, y, and I'm history free, this condition will be used. Uh, it's an important reason to include it in the definition. I know I'm history free in x plus 1. Uh, and I'm expressing this in terms of what happens in the next column. I will take x plus 1 and transition at some value k. And then, because I just transitioned, I will be history free in that column, as promised. Um, it'll be more convenient, probably, if we just all also modify the definition to say, you have also not grabbed the value in the current cell. So, okay, you have not grabbed the value in the current cell, let's go ahead and add some value here. Uh, let's grab x, y. So basically, you are history free at x, y, and you have not grabbed the value at the current cell. Grab the current cell, uh, you're forced to do so, and then max over all possible transition states. Give this expression. That will be your optimal value after you transition to the next column. And now we have to add in everything that happens in the current column. So what happens in the current column? Well, first of all, you are forced. You have no choice. Like, if you choose to transition at k, then you are forced to capture this sum. Right? You are, you are basically forced to capture this sum right here. So what sum is this? 
it's some, uh, I, will, I, I will express this as sum, and I will make sum basically be a function that takes an x and takes two y parameters. So sum will be some function like x, y1, y2. And it, in, the, in the x column, it gets the sum of all the elements between y1 and y2. Uh, so I will take x, uh, like the current column, I'm forced to capture this sum at a minimum, right? Because there's no way I can get here. Um, if I started here, there's no way I can get here without capturing all these values. Yeah? So I'm going to capture sum x, and then I'm going to go from, uh, well, th th now there's going to be a conditional statement here. I will only show one version of it, because it depends if k is ahead of y or not, right? Like k could be down here, or k could be up here. In the case where k is less, then, then it will be x um, k y minus 1. Alternatively, it has to be k plus 1 to y. Or if it's equal, then it's 0. So like, this is just one condition. Like, I'll just, I'll just caution, you know, caution just one condition. Uh, I don't know what to call this uh, condition. You know, you have to, uh, you have to also give the case for the other one. You can probably design the sum function to handle this logic so that you don't have to worry about that. Uh, in fact, you might be able to include this into the sum as well. Like, why not? Okay, but this is not all. Right? This is not all. Why is it not all? Because if, if it were all, then it would be just like the other problem. Uh, well, you did y minus and then multiply. Well, okay, so you have your y here and you want to go to k. It basically means that after you've already captured the cell, you're going to have to, well, okay, it's easier probably if we remove this and we just include this as part of the sum. So then, you know, go ahead and just say y. Uh, it's because we had already counted that element. But, you know, okay. So we will then capture, you know, then, then we are just in, kind of including this in the green zone. Where, this, this is a sum. Like, what's in this green zone is a sum. Okay. Uh, but this is not all, right? Because if this were all, it would be just like the other problem. The difference is we can also go down here. We're allowed to, like, kind of swipe down here and come back. Like, these are values that we are forced to take. This is the distinction. We are forced to take these values, even if they're negative. Even if these are bad for us, if we want to go here, we must take them. Uh, but these values, we have the option. Like, we have to take, like, if there's some negative values here, and there's some big positive values over here, then we might still take some negative values here to get to these big positives. So we have to take that into account. But we are not really forced to take anything. We could just decide to take zero here. It's unlike the sum, where we would take the sum even if it's negative. Okay, so um, how do we take, how do we take uh, this? Well, the operation we actually need here is we need this, uh, I'll call it, we will, take, we will basically take some uh, kind of like, I'll call it like a suffix here, maximum sum suffix. So, or, or rather, no, let's call it prefix. Uh, prefix makes more sense here. Like, so basically of this array, uh, like, think of the array that is not covered by the sum that starts here. Think of this entire array. We want to take the maximum sum prefix of it. Let's say it's this area shaded blue. That's what we want to take, right? Because, because if we did not take the maximum sum prefix here, this part can be substituted out without breaking this transition. <coughs> so if there was like some better thing we could take here, some better prefix, we would take it. So it follows that we're going to take like the maximum sum prefix here and add it to our total. And here we're going to do something similar. Here we are going to take the maximum sum suffix. Right? Like what I mean by suffix is like this is the relevant array and we take some maximum suffix of it. Okay, so now we're nearly done. Uh, now we just have to include two more terms. So basically, uh, we call this like some other function, max prefix. Uh, and this starts at y plus 1. 
to n, or you know, we'll always include x as a parameter. All of these have like two y parameters and an x parameter. x, y plus 1, n. Or sorry, no. Uh, yeah, well, uh, keep in mind these may be inverted. If the, if the k comes after the y, these could, will be inverted. Like basically this expression is for the case where the k comes before the y. There's a very similar looking expression when k is after the y. Okay, so max prefix, and then max suffix. x, uh, y, uh, sorry, x, uh, and, and then the maximum prefix is taken between uh, 0 and uh, k, k, k. Uh, k minus 1. Okay, um, and now, well, oh, okay, and so here we're done. Uh, how long will this function take to evaluate? Uh, this function is a linear function, like this can be coded in linear time. This is not particularly difficult to do. Uh, this is just a very naive algorithm. You scan elements and you keep track of the best suffix so far, and you just pick the best suffix. This is a linear time algorithm. This is a linear time algorithm. This is a linear time algorithm, even with no optimization. So basically, one iteration of this loop is now taking linear time, linear with respect to the y. So remember, we call this, we call this uh, m, right? And we call this n. So that means that one iteration of this loop, just evaluating this, is order is order m. Okay. Now, we have to do this in a loop over all possible y's. So now this is order, m, you know, this is order m iterations of an expression that is order m. So total, like, like basically this part is order m. Right, this is order m. Um, but this part, you know, doing this whole loop is like another m. So this will be order m squared. Okay, uh, and now finally, how many of these parameters are there? Order, this is m, or sorry, this is n, n and yeah. this is m. So, so basically now the number of states is just n m, which is nice, that's a nice reduction. It also means our space usage will be just as m n. Uh, and, but but uh, time per state has now risen to m squared. So the, the space complexity will be improved because there's few, fewer states, but, but the total time complexity will be the product of these, and we will still get the same thing as before. Now, good news. Uh, I've run out of time, and I won't, you know, uh, continue, I, I won't show exactly how to do this, but the good news is we can, uh, we can do a pre-computation for all of these functions. Uh, so this is a common concept in advanced dynamic programming problems. The idea is that you will pre-compute some values that are not really part of the recursive function, like these like sum, max, prefix, and so on. So think of it this way. For a particular, um, you can pre-compute this like sum x, like you can pre-compute all of these in something like order, you can actually do it in order uh, mn time even, but let's say we, uh, we just do it like these parameters are actually fixed, so there's only mn distinct calls here. Uh, and here there's mn squared calls, but okay. You can find a way to pre-compute tables for these parameters, like x, y, like this is only mn squared different possible calls here. You can find, and this is only mn possible calls here because it's always n, and this is mn possible calls here. You can pre-compute tables for this in just order mn squared time. So we can do a pre-processing where in order mn squared, we, uh, or sorry, not uh, m, m squared n. In order m squared n, we will pre-compute the tables for these things. And then getting these will just be a lookup. Getting these will just be like, uh, you know, we will access an array with like these arguments, x, k, y. And then these operations will reduce the constant time. <laughs> so we will reduce this to constant time. We will reduce this to constant time. And we will reduce this to constant time. This whole expression will now be constant time. This will become order one 
with this pre-commutation. Uh, and this loop will become order n. And now we will reduce this here. And this will finally allow us to reach a better time complexity than we had reached before. OK, uh, so there will be uh, you know, kind of like a homework with a solution posted by me to implement this. It's not a small thing, but you, know, you take it piece by piece, optimization by optimization, and you can do it.